Um, a very warm welcome from me as well here at Wikimedia Deutschland. I'm um, very excited to welcome you all here in our space and I'm very glad that you made it from Tiergarten probably to the bit cooler place in Berlin which is Kreuzberg of course. Um, I'm Nicole Eber, I'm Director of International Re uh, Relations at Wikimedia Deutschland and yeah, Wikimedia Deutschland is really a part, is part of a larger network of non-profit organizations and communities that are all united under one vision that every single human, human oh, oh, got it, got it, got it, sorry, that was too fast, that every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. And together with an international and virtual team, I am, and the Wikimedia Foundation, I am leading Wikimedia's global strategy process, which is called Wikimedia 2030. Um, how does the international community envision the future of Wikimedia, of our projects like Wikipedia, of course, and also Wikidata and others, our contributors, our global organizational structures, and our power dynamics? How can we adapt to the ever-changing world around us? Um, what is beyond the concept of the encyclopedia that we all know? And what forms of knowledge will be at the center of education in the future? Uh, when I read about today's event, I found the term terminology sound, uh, sounded pretty uh, familiar. You also care about diversity, about equity, about care, and of course about education. And that is very close to what we are currently dealing with as well. Our lived values are radical openness, transparency, uh, transparency, participation in decision making, and also global collaboration. But the question is, how do we actually build a global community's future on those values? In the first phase of the strategy process in, we, uh, in 2017, after a year of consultations and research, we agreed upon our new strategic direction. And that is also what is here behind me on the screen. Um, um, that by 2030, Wikimedia will become the essential support system for the ecosystem or of the ecosystem of free knowledge. And everyone who shares our vision will be able to join us. One of our strategic priorities in that strategic direction is the concept of knowledge equity. And I'm going to like quote from, from that direction exactly. As a social movement, we will focus our efforts on the knowledge and communities that have been left out by, uh, by structures of power and privilege. We will welcome people from every background to build strong, diverse communities. And we will break down social, political, and technical barriers, preventing people from accessing and contributing to free knowledge. Sounds great, right? Um, but the big question is, how do we actually get there? How do we bring this to life? What do we need to change in our own structures, in our behaviors, in our culture, and our perspectives to actually get there? Luckily, I don't have to answer these questions, but I have a huge and global community <coughs> whose expertise and perspective and motivation we can tap into. In June last year, so in 2018, <coughs> we have formed nine, nine working groups on topics like diversity, resource allocation, community health or partnerships. Um, <coughs> okay, one second, I need a sip of water. Their task is to create recommendations for change in Wikimedia's core functions and structures. Next week, rec a representative of these working groups will come here to Berlin, to this spot, to the beautiful and very cool Kreuzberg, uh, to finalize these recommendations. And that has, it has been a very long and a very messy and super complex journey so far. And that is not only because the process is so so messy and so complex, but it's especially on the perspectives and on the diversity side. Our community on knowledge equity really urges us to bring people in who have been left out before. But our community is pretty Europe and North America centered, mostly white, not very young, with a higher level of education. 
And what is super difficult is to design for who is not yet here. Um, while, and while still holding up our value of self-determination. Um, and what is, what is so important in this, in this regard is that we have to really critically reflect upon ourselves basically all the time. So we have to ask all these questions, we have to ask the right questions, the tough questions, and ask the questions to the right people, with the right people in the room. And these questions are often uncomfortable and really not easy. And it is always also a question of perspectives. Many of the original parts of our movement come from privileged contexts. But even for them, the resources seem to be scarce or artificially limited, so they always have the feeling they never really felt privileged and were struggling to get the resources that they needed. Um, so this complexity really, or this situation basically, needs a lot of work, a lot of conversations, um, a lot of really tough conversations about privilege, about power, and about equal distribution, and also, of course, conversations about giving up space. Um, to, to further, to increase diversity, and also to exercise care, and to be more inclusive, we need to change. I mean, we, that is basically clear, we need to change. There is absolutely no space for harassment in our projects. This is a quote that Catherine Mayer, the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, made super clear in her closing speech at this year's global community gathering, Wikimania, in, that happened in Stockholm in August. Her, so harassment is really another topic high on the agenda for our working groups and for our movement. They suggest to introduce a universal code of conduct to improve online behavior, to prevent harassment, and to create safe spaces. But with this, with all these recommendation, recommendations and suggestions and code of conduct, we are of course not done yet. Next year we will have to go into implementation, into imp implementing these changes, and that, that will again be really hard work and tough conversations that will need to happen, so please keep your fingers crossed for us. Um, and I wanted to end with the, to say like really free knowledge, it's really a radical act. Um, and we go, don't get to, and if, so it's, a, it's really a radical act, and if we don't get to change our own structures radically and form strong coalitions um, for this cause and team up with our partners and with our allies around free knowledge and open education, we might really lose that fight. Um, and this is why I'm so, so super glad to see you all here, um, that you came to Wikimedia, um, as this event, I think, can really strengthen the ties between our communities and your communities, and maybe we at one point become one community, so that we can strive strongly and successfully to, towards a participatory and democratic culture in the open and in society in general. So I hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks for having me here, and I'm giving it back to Christian again. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, next up is Marin. Marin Deepwell, the CEO of all the co-organizers. Thank you, and um, good evening to you all. It is a real privilege for um, myself and my colleague Martin from the Association of Learning Technology in the UK to be here this evening. And I'm very mindful that many of you are making a real effort to having this event in English, and I wanted to Thank you, hopefully in German, which is my mother tongue, but then I don't speak it much anymore. Aber ich wollte mich ganz herzlich bei Christian und Christina vor allem bedanken, weil die alles organisiert haben und das Leben für uns ganz einfach gemacht haben. Und obwohl wir nun in England alles daran legen anscheinend, nicht mehr Teil der europäischen Gemeinschaft zu sein, sind wir als Assoziation trotzdem sehr daran interessiert, weiterhin international mit euch allen zusammenzuarbeiten und von euch zu hören. Und hoffentlich kann ich eure Fragen nach unserer ähm, Konversation in Deutsch und in Englisch beantworten. Right, I'm going to switch back into a language I'm more familiar with again. <laughs> But I wanted to say that Open for a cause was really born of a casual conversation, and it's one of these things 
that may have never happened if the people involved didn't really care. And I wanted to share with you, just as my bit of the opening, just some causes that I feel we as a body really care about and that I as an individual really care about. And we really have come to think over the last 10 years quite a lot about how openness relates to using technology for learning, teaching, and assessment. And the more we learn about openness in different sectors, in an institution, and as part of a professional practice, the more we really learn how powerful it can be and how powerful a tool it can be, both in terms of collaborating fairly and transparently with industry, to encourage institutions to share across their borders and across their walls, to stop competing and to start working together more. And I, the more I learn about educational technology and how frightening it is, the more I think openness is really the only way. It is not a perfect way and not an unproblematic way, and it certainly has a dark underbelly, but I still feel it's got the most potential to help us meet some of these challenges. And tonight we're joined by many people who might be watching this as a recording at some point in the future, and I hope that you will still join into the conversation and share that message with us. If you're interested to find out more about the work that we do as an association and in the UK, I'd strongly recommend you start with this call to action for policymakers that we published last year, and which is um, openly licensed and hopefully is useful to you. But before I hand over back to Christian, I wanted to point out two things that are maybe more personally important to me, but also to us as an association. And one is a project that's currently happening which is the creation of an open social justice quilt, which is being made for the OER conference in April in London. And this is a community-led project to make a quilt out of all sorts of things in order to bring it together both online and in person and really try and include different voices in a very different way. Fem EdTech is a network which promotes gender equality in learning technology, and I'm a volunteer, but this is really a group effort, a community effort. And um, I think when this project came out, I was maybe expecting there to be local people within the community who would come to the conference contributing. And now it's kind of snowballed into different parts of the world um, and all over different continents, people are getting in touch to try and contribute. And it reminded me in a very unexpected way of the power that when you do open out an invitation, and I think the organizers of this project issued a very warm and heartfelt invitation, there can be a response and there can be a lot of power behind that community coming together. And I do hope that tonight we can also talk a little bit about some of the issues of care in openness, because this event is very much inspired by its theme, by the conference, this is chaired by three volunteers as well, um, Daniel, Jonathan and Mia, who have come together to organize the Care and Openness Conference in April in London. It is going to be focused on issues of privilege, equity, precarity, power relations and public interest. And in that context, I really wanted to acknowledge that actually in the UK at the moment in higher education, we are on strike. Um, or I am not on strike as I don't work in higher education per se, but many of our colleagues are on strike and many of them can't be here tonight or can't participate because of that. And some of them have made it possible and negotiated that difficult platform for themselves so that they can contribute. So I just wanted to acknowledge as well that sometimes with educational technology and open education, we are far closer to the sort of political realities and discussing the value of labor and the value of our individual choices, then maybe it looks when we think about it from a more academic point of view or from a community point of view. So with that, I wanted to close and issue you with a warm invitation to engage with this conversation. Um, we hoffen auf Deutsch und auf Englisch, aber hoffentlich meist auf Englisch. And with that, I'm going to hand back to Christian. Thank you. Thank you, Marin. Um, it'll take me just a second to get up here. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't pre bring any slides. I apologize for that as well. Um, but I found it funny. Um, Marin, you've been, you, you arrived a bit early, and uh, we, we had a couple of conversations. And we kind of laughed at the fact that this event only came together because we had wine at the CC Summit in Lisbon in May. Um, 
where basically uh, Christina, Martin, uh, Marin, and I um, had the conversation that OEB is happening in Berlin, that our offices are close by, and that it might make sense to um, convene for, for a more conversational thing. And while it doesn't look conversational right now, I hope and promise that it will be more conversational later on. Um, so we kind of wanted to add a couple of more flavors to what um, the, the, the mix in, in this town is going to be discussing with regards to openness, to ed tech, and, and to all that. And much of the work that um, you would reference then is actually uh, sitting personalized in this room. Um, much of the work that I myself have engaged with and that I have done myself would never have been possible without, without some of the people's work in this room. And um, being German, I'm not well trained in applauding others' work to some extent, but um, I'm, I'm going to try to and at least appreciate the work that has been uh, done before here. Um, so let's start with Lorna. Um, she's, she founded the Open Scotland Initiative. She's a vice chair of and trustee at Wikimedia UK, if I got that right. Um, she's one of the critical voices in open education, questioning power structures in open all the time, and rightfully so. Um, questioning dynamics uh, of privatization and of the open web, be it at the OER conferences and elsewhere. Um, she was the uh, co-chair of my first OER conference in uh, Edinburgh, I think, OER 16, right? Um, and I recommend anyone remotely interested in open education to go and check out her keynote from OER 18 and to read everything she's ever published on her blog at lornacampbell.org. Uh, next one in line in alphabetical order is um, Laura Chernowicz. Um, she's the director of the Center for Innovation and Learning, uh, Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. Um, and her work will most probably be cited whenever somebody speaks about inequality in education and especially in uh, e-learning, online learning, online education. Um, and that has given, and her work has given many the opportunity to question own assumptions, to question own beliefs, to question narratives around democratizing uh, education by simply putting it online. And um, she deserves a big thank you for that. Um, we've also already heard from Marin Deepwell. Um, she's the CEO of the Association for Learning Technology. She's been the CEO since 2012. Um, I've only become aware of her work um, in, I think, 2015 at one of the OER conferences, but um, only looking from afar and thought I, I should go there and visited OER 16 then. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence because she has been working continuously to open up that kind of conference, to open up that space at Alt as well for others to come in and to not make it simply UK-based, and we've talked about that a bit as well today as well. Um, so she and her team have given many uh, critical voices and opened the stage and the spotlight. And um, open education would have, would have been much more flavorless without that kind of work. Um, Martin, back there. Um, he's the one uh, who's basically made it possible for me to look that information up because he's, as far as I understand it, also responsible for running the OER conference websites and all that and it's one of the few conference websites that you can actually still go to five years later on and you won't find one single broken link. Um, you can go back, you can go back to recordings. It is actually um, um, kind of, I, th I know many people in tech admire that kind of work and I can appreciate it, but I don't understand it at all. Um, but Martin also has a very rare talent. He's patient and polite whenever somebody like me just walks in and asks a stupid question. Uh, so he understands both the plumbing and the wiring of the web, but also the way to, to implement software and to actually deal with humans and communities while doing so. Um, he stays calm while doing that, and um, that must be a privilege for everybody um, who works with him. Um, last not least, certainly, um, Audrey Waters. Um, I think the, the first, first adjective that comes to mind is fierce. Um, I think that's putting it mildly. Um, when I started out in the field of learning and technology, and it's only been like eight or nine years ago, um, and I stumbled onto the Hack Education website a bit later on, um, and I 
astounded eye-opening because you don't see anything that you look at in ad tech or in online learning the same way once you've um, checked out Audrey's work. And she kind of dismantles the narratives around education technology like only few people I know and read. She calls out bullshit when she sees it. She connects the dots between tech and solutionist narratives, between culture, politics, policy, society, education, and the web. And it's a true privilege to have you all here tonight. So thank you for that. But before we get started with the short talks, um, a brief and but quick and um, heartfelt thank you. Um, both to Christina, my colleague and partner in crime in organizing this event, sitting right here. Round of applause, please. <laughs> to Robert and Mark from our event team, who are making this run as smoothly as um, any Wikimedia event will ever run again. Thank you for that. Um, but also to Dominic, Dominic Scholl. He's sitting in the last row, and he, likes to, he usually likes to keep it that way. <laughs> Um, but he kind of gave us the leeway to actually make this event happen in the first place, and um, thank you for that as well. And of course, Nicole, you've already met her. <laughs> um, she didn't blink um, when, when we asked her to introduce um, Wikimedia and to say a, a quick welcome. So thank you for that as well. I'm handing it over now to first, I think, Laura. Uh, then Martin and then Audrey for short talks. Then we'll have, as I mentioned earlier, five to ten minutes break for a restroom or a quick drink. And then we'll get started with the discussion that is going to close the evening. So, Laura, here you go. Thanks very much. Um, I'm really keen for this to be informal and conversational, and this feels really not very informal and conversational, so I hope that people will... Respond. I'm going to talk quite informally myself, despite the lights on the microphone, um, and I don't have slides. And I really appreciated what you said, Nicole, when you started talking about some of the issues facing us. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, reflecting on how we make these futures. So, um, as Christian said, I, I work in a university. I run a center for teaching and learning. I'm also a professor and an academic, so I sit on all the academic structures. And so my question is, if you're in a system, in a higher education system today, how do you work to, to make change? How do you do that? Um, and I've been doing that now for, it's just under 20 years. And so I'm kind of thinking about the strategies that I've been drawing on. So can I ask how many people here are in universities? Okay, a handful. Okay, so some people, but I can't assume you all are, but maybe these are the kinds of things that we all face in organizations. If you're in a system and you're earning a salary. Um, and I've, I've always tried to think of myself as a principled pragmatist. And, and lately I'm thinking about it's a really fine line that, you know, pragmatism means you do what you have to do and in a way that you can live with yourself, but in a way that you consider principled and it's being really stretched, I'm finding of late. So the ways that I find that I get involved in, in making change are, are three ways. I mean, the one way is implementing the university strategies in the area of teaching and learning and that tends to be things like graduate attributes, whatever the term of the moment is, changes every few years. But, you know, literacies and digital literacies and things like that. And those are, they're not uncontentious, but they're, you know, uh, they're relatively straightforward. Then you get things like innovating in teaching and learning. So there you're kind of pushing things a bit. And that's things like, um, say, at the moment it would be micro-credentials. You know, that's not in on the radar, but you're starting to say maybe this is an opportunity to increase access and let's see what we can do with that. The third way is actually the, the more challenging way, which is really, for me, the values-based issues. So when you were talking, you were talking about the open education community. But I'm not in the open education community in my day-to-day -day work. 
So it's refreshing to be talking to other people whose starting point is the same, but what do you do when you're trying to insert an agenda, a set of values, a set of ways of thinking into a very well entrenched organization, which despite the fact that it's involved in knowledge generation is actually very firmly committed to staying just the same it always has for many hundreds and hundreds of years. What do you do? What do you do every day when you're in that system? So the one thing that I do and that I, I think is a way of making change is sitting on committees. And, and, and people often say to me, what? Like, how is that making change? But that's where the work happens in universities. So occasionally we see examples of that having an effect. Um, and there's one example at my university recently, one of my colleagues has been sitting on the community, the committee that uh, awards the, there's a best book, the best academic book that the, the university gives. And she's been sitting on the committee and she's been saying, you know, we really should give an award for an open textbook. And a while ago, the, the chair of that committee and the vice chancellor or somebody said, yes, that's a good idea. And so she then has sat there and she has repeated. And we are now going to be giving an, an award for an open education textbook. I'm not sure the university understands what it's agreed to be awarding, but that is a huge shift. And that's dogged committee work. So a lot of that is around um, really dull work, except that if you volunteer to take the minutes, which many women now refuse to do because it's gender related, except taking the minutes is also the record of what was agreed at a committee. So I think there's a lot to be said for agreeing to taking the minutes. Um, the other thing that I think is really boring to do, but absolutely essential, is agreeing to respond to requests for policy negotiation. So I don't know about your context, but there's a lot of policies going on nationally and institutionally around intellectual property, around um, which is very close to issues around education and urban education and, and other such things. And that's another thing that makes people's eyes glaze over. But it's very often the place that some key principles get put down. And so I think that's another area that one actually needs to be involved in to do the really, really slow, hard work of change. The other strategy, this is on a completely different note, is to bring in outsiders, preferably from very prestigious places, to say what you've been saying all along. <laughs> and make sure that the right people are at that meeting. And then when the, somebody important says, Wow, that was really interesting the, the person from, you know, fill in what's considered important in your context. And you go, what a good idea, and then you go away and you do it. So that's really handy. Um, the other thing to do, I think, is to offer to run events. So run events on, I've recently offered to run an event on micro-credentials, because I think it has some real opportunities, and people aren't quite sure what it is, but okay, so I think that's a way to do it. Um, and then the other thing I think, of course, is to find money for things that the university won't pay for. Find your own money for something that you think needs to be put on the agenda and just don't wait for somebody to offer it to you. Just get on with it. Um, so these are kind of the sort of strategies that one can pursue and that I've tried to pursue to set about making change happen. Um, I think if you call things by very bold Names, and if you say the word share, it's a very bad idea. Sharing does not go down well in a very conservative environment, a straightforward environment. You have to use the language that people will be able to engage with. So that's the kind of solid work. I think the more difficult work is when you have to make decisions about change in the face of challenging and political circumstances. So you mentioned earlier about the, the strike in the UK. Um, We've had situations running the Center for Teaching and Learning where we've had student protests and where we've been asked to provide blended learning. And I've seen the same thing in Hong Kong recently. What, what is the principled, pragmatic 
decision to do to what what do you do in a in a circumstance like that that's much more complex actually and and those are not as rare as one would have thought they they used to be the exception but i think what we're starting to see you know in different in, in the uk in hong kong different parts of the world that's becoming part of the job in ways we hadn't quite anticipated so i think i'm going to stop there because i'm i'm really hoping that this will be a, a conversation we can pick up okay Lorna. i think martin's up yeah. next right <coughs> thank you laura I'll just pass the mic over. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you, Christine, also um, for the kind words. Um, I think, uh, in terms of your yourself, I think. Um, I like to acknowledge your own generosity and caring within our community. Um, I know how, given that I help uh, run various events for all, I, I know it's it's never a straightforward thing, particularly when presenters come up to you shortly before you start and say, "I've got some audio in my slides. <laughs> <laughs> can can you?" Uh, so it's actually nice in some ways to be asked to, to, to have someone else to ask to do that, and also to have someone as nice as you um, make it seamlessly happen. Um, so, um, something I want to kind of spotlight and um, hopefully generate a bit of debate is uh, one of the conference themes this year for OER20 is openness in the age of surveillance. And um, this is one. This is an area uh, I'm, I have an interest in, uh, partly because, um, for those that know me, I, I I do a bit of enabling surveillance within the community. I provide a tool that basically allows people to scrape Twitter. Um, so uh, that leaves me conflicted sometimes. Um, but I, uh, there's a couple of things within way the way things are developing right now that I don't have the answers to and so uh, I'm hoping you can provide those answers for me. Um, so, but before we go there, I've got a short video. John Doe. Why was he never ID'd from the eye scan? On account of those are not his eyes. He had them swapped out to fool the scanners. You can get it done on the street for a few thousand bucks these days. I'm going to enjoy working here. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less been identified on the metro. The train makes two stops at 20th and 33rd. Send units to each location. Never make 20th. Have faith. Uh, John, 
to square some of these. And with that, I've destroyed my minority report for you. Um, so um, that was uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, take on 2050 or 2054, I think it was. And it's not particularly a future I want. Um, I don't want to be surveilled as I walk around in the open. But what we're seeing right now is a huge boom in surveillance um, and surveillance as a service, essentially. So uh, these are just a couple of examples of some of the uh, companies that are providing very simple s solutions. Um, even, you know, you, you don't need to do much to start taking images in and doing face uh, recognition and detection on those. Uh, and there's no restriction on sign up. It's, you know, you fill in a, a website form, you can get a 30 day trial. Um, I think one of the perhaps even more worrying um, things with this is these organizations have built um, services basically by using data sets. Um, when uh, face recognition was first developed in the 1960s, they had 2,000 mugshots. And now here's one data set from Microsoft of 100 uh, sorry, 10 million celebrity faces. And there are other data sets um, out there equally as big, um, even bigger. In terms of openness, um, I think one of the things that really concerns me is the fact that um, we're not consenting to this. So our data in terms of entering these machine algorithms that then many of them having uh, various biases that have been reported um, and used widely by um, not just private individuals, but law enforcement as well. They're, they're, they're basically being fueled by the availability of data out there. Um, there's a really nice project um, that I think is highlighting some of the, um, the things that are going on currently within, within our uh, our lives. Um, so, for example, you might not think that you're in a data set, but um, if you walked in Oxford Town Centre in, uh, I think it's November and December 2009, uh, you're potentially in a data set. So these, uh, uh, what Megapixels is doing is, is basically finding these da data sets that are publicly available and just reporting on them. So if you were in Duke University, uh, 2016, walking around uh, as a faculty member, a member of staff, someone visiting, you're potentially in a, a data set. So uh, the Duke one it has two million images in it. Um, in terms of openness, I think um, something we saw quite recently was, um, do you remember this new story about um, IBM using Flickr images for their data set, so 100 million images. So as part of the headline, um, you know, it, it was highlighted that the images that um, IBM were using were, were Creative Commons license. Um, and did, did, did anyone follow this story? Did anyone stop putting images into Flickr as a, a consequence or consider how they licensed their images? Well, the really, well, I think depressing thing is um, it doesn't matter that those images were Creative Commons um, because IBM could have used those images anyway and completely negated any sort of um, copyright that had been placed on them by using fair use. Um, so uh, this allows text and data mining. Um, so, you know, IBM could have gone in, got those images uh, Creative Commons took a lot, I think, of unfair, unfair flack as a consequence of that. And if you think about it, um, you know, if you go into, uh, as I always do, go and Google my own name, 
and look at the images, you can see the consequences of, of the data mining that has been going on for a long time. So I've put my name in there and uh, it's turning up various images, various different licenses. Some of those are copyright licenses, um, but they're there, they're, they're searchable. And us, us as individuals have no control over this. Uh, the legislation isn't there to prevent me from um, saying to IBM, Google, Microsoft, whoever, not to use my content in that way. And that extends beyond face recognition and surveillance. It, you know, there's been uh, various uses by Google, ex for example, of uh, Wikimedia data as part of their knowledge graph. And uh, I think whilst I can see some of the benefits of Google using fair use to start mining you know, all the text that's written. At the same time, at what cost does that, that come to us as a society? Um, and I think it obviously goes beyond images. Uh, you know, uh, there's an example uh, from a couple of years ago where uh, data mining from social media sites has been used um, and resold to law enforcement. Um, again, uh, you know, to target people without really caring about, um, you know, the consequences of that. Um, so just to kind of wrap it up and kind of square the circle in terms of uh, the, the mi minority report, um, so that was from uh, Spielberg's 2050 future. Um, so this was an example I put together for uh, the domains conference earlier in the year. So it's based on um, the John Carpenter uh, film, They Live. And uh, if you go into the slides, you can see the clip from it. But the thing I want to highlight here is, um, so what this is doing is, um, basically, it's using a webcam and it's sending my image uh, from the webcam into an API, the, the Karos API. And this is the data that's coming back. So it didn't matter if I was wearing sunglasses uh, in 2050 uh, because um, the Karos API can detect that. And as well as that, it's pulling back other data, you know, demographics, so my age, um, my... <coughs> Uh, ethnicity. So uh, I'm afraid in terms of uh, my minority report, we've, we've kind of already reached that point a lot earlier. Um, and uh, I think it's very clear that legislation has failed to keep up with this. Um, so I don't really, as I said at the beginning, I don't really have an answer to this. So uh, which is one of the reasons I'm really interested to see how this particular theme is tackled at OER20. And also, if you've got any thoughts or suggestions, um, please come and find me. We'll share them here. And um, I think that is me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin. Um, Audrey, you're up. Thank you. No, I don't have slides. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me today. I'm a little jet lagged, so I wrote down some thoughts just to make sure that I actually had <laughs> could make complete sentences. Um, you know, when I looked at the topics that were going to be addressed tonight, um, I was a little jealous that I didn't think of uh, open in the time of in the age of surveillance. Um, uh, because I think that that is so incredibly desperately important, particularly for the work that I do in in education, education technology. I don't work for an institution. I work for myself, um, which means that I can often sometimes come in and kick the hornet's nest and say the things um, that 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 people uh, that people um, don't otherwise. But I think that this idea of surveillance and surveillance becoming um, a, heightened, a heightened part of students' day-to-day -day experiences 
um, both on and offline in school is, is incredibly important to, to consider and incredibly important to, to stop. Um, initially, I was actually going to talk tonight about uh, predicting the future and the future of education. And what's of, often so horrifying to me is that there are legions of people in Silicon Valley right now building what they think are the schools of tomorrow who think that Minority Report is the most amazing thing that they've ever thought seen in their lives um, and that would be thrilled at the idea of being able to predict and shape students' lives that way. Um, I'm often mortified to hear the the science fiction movies that I think are clearly in the dystopian fiction category that get heralded as being um, the model for the future of education. Um, I'll go on a little tangent. Uh, Saul Khan, for example, from Khan Academy, um, said that he modeled his idea after Ender's Game, which, if you've read it, is actually a science fiction novel in which children against their knowledge or consent are marshaled in some sort of AI thing to fight an intergalactic battle and commit um, genocide. So I don't know. I think that maybe that's not the best model for um, making math worksheets. Um, but that's just, that's just me. I was also going to talk a little bit tonight about probably one of my favorite least slash least favorite Wikipedia entries, which is the predictions that uh, Ray about uh, made by Ray Kurzweil about the future. Um, Ray Kurzweil is a currently employed by Google. Um, he's probably most famous for his prediction that by the middle of this century that um, artificial intelligence will surpass human intelligence and at some point in the future we'll be able to upload our brains um, into computers and we will only live uh, virtually. Uh, I think the man is full of shit, but he has a Wikipedia entry and I don't, so <laughs> make, of that, make of that what you will. Um, I think that what's interesting to me is that there are all of these kinds of predictions about the future that are often taken as truths and then repeated and nobody asks sort of, you know, in the case of Ray Kurzweil, basic questions of biology. Um, and, and pushes back on them. And I think that we live in a particular moment where we're starting to realize that some of these truths are actually being repeated and are skewing our democratic practices, right? I mean, we live in the world of, of misinformation. Um, and yet, I think the tech industry in particular and the ed tech industry are quite committed to perpetuating misinformation. Um, about what the future will look like. I actually have a website. Um, I can't remember if I renewed it, this domain. So I think I have a website at edtech.wtf in which I list some of, um, I hope I did renew it because that's a really good one. Oh, good. Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In which I list some of these predictions about the future, the future of school. Um, so anyway, I was going to write, I was going to have a talk about the prediction. This still, yeah, I'm, I'm relieved. Um, I, I'm a slave to that domain now, I think. I have to keep paying it. Oh, well. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about misinformation, but it's sort of hard to, um, hard to narrow that down into a five-minute talk. And then I got so angry when I was preparing my keynote for tomorrow morning at OEB, thinking about misinformation, that um, I don't even know if they're going to be able to drag me off the stage after 15, 20 minutes tomorrow morning. So instead, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, an idea that's in my forthcoming book that actually relates quite closely with what, what Martin talked about in about surveillance. And that's um, the notion of the nudge, right? So we, have, we live in an age of surveillance in which we are, um, our lives are being data mined, data analysis, we're being algorithmically analyzed by a variety of machines. But it's also, we live in an age of behavioral conditioning in which we are with the data that's being extracted and in the hopes of more data extraction, we're being nudged to make certain behaviors on and offline. Um, and the, actually, the nudge has its origins in education technology to a certain extent. In the work of B.F. Skinner, who in the mid-1950s 
was designing teaching machines that he argued would be superior to humans, um, that would make, that would individualize education, that would move children through their lessons uh, more rapidly than a human, human teacher could. And he based this, his work on operant conditioning in part by the work he did on pigeons, which is why I have the pigeon on the edtech.wtf uh, website, um, in which he would condi con condition pigeons, give them rewards, food, food pellets, and he would get them to perform um, tasks like play ping pong. Um, he was working on a project to use pigeons to guide missiles during World War II um, and to teach children, um, thinking that children could, children could be trained much like pigeons. And actually, this idea of using behavioral engineering, although I think many people in education technology would say that they refute that, that that's not what they are doing, but I think it actually is at the core of a lot of what we do, what we're, what we're being nudged to do online, both in ed tech and in other social media tech as well. We're always getting the push notification, the nudge, the little red circle that tells you how many text messages, being encouraged to um, take certain actions to keep us on websites longer, to click on more things, et cetera. You know, the, and I think that in the early 1970s, Noam Chomsky pushed back on Skinner. Skinner wrote a book very famously called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, in which he said that he didn't believe in freedom. Uh, he didn't believe in human agency. He believed that society could be behaviorally engineered and that smart people like himself would do a much better job at making society than democratic practices were. And Noam Chomsky wrote a book or a book review in which he sort of blasted, blasted Skinner and said that Skinner's ideas were as, quote, amenable to the fascists as they were to the libertarians, which I think is a really interesting turn of phrase because I think that that's exactly what we find that much of the tech industry today is being as amenable to the fascists as to the libertarians. Noting, right, noting whose politics, which political ideologies are left out of that framing, right? Fascism or libertarianism, that seems to be our choice, um, which is frightening and dystopian, and yet, like Minority Re Report, a future that many entrepreneurs and engineers would happily nudge us, nudge us into. Because of course they believe that they have our best, best interests at heart, because they went to Stanford and MIT and Harvard and the other centers of the moral universe. I'm joking. Um, but behavioral, engineer, behavioral engineering is very much how these technologies are being designed today. You can take a class at Stanford that will teach you how to nudge people um, most famously, I think, uh, the founders of Instagram uh, attended that class. Um, and based on software design, uh, user interface design and the like, we're told to sort of click. And we're nudged to hand over our data. And we're nudged to participate. And that's where I think it gets challenging when we talk about openness. Um, values that I think that, um, values that we think are or it might be oriented towards social justice quickly get co-opted and I think transformed into something far more insidious, insidious and damaging, right? Um, and I think that we have to start talking about whose values do we mean when we think about open. Um, you know, I think that open doesn't do enough of the work, particularly if we are faced with people like Skinner who believe that they know better. Right. Mark Zuckerberg wants us to be open. Mark Zuckerberg wants us to open our lives to data mining, to nudging, and he's investing billions and billions of dollars in education to make schools of the future look like that. Um, because he believes that he can engineer us and engineer a better world by connecting us or some other crap like that. You know, and I think that that's what we have to do. We have to figure out how we're going to re reconcile being open in a world in which a lot of the technologies we do are actively manipulating 
um, with your reconcile what it means to be open using technologies that perhaps don't believe in freedom or technology. I think that we have to really have a much more sophisticated politics of open. And I actually, I think that the folks here today do in, in many ways. Um, but I think we can't let that adjective do the hard political work um, that really comes, that really demands that we sort of orient ourselves towards justice and dignity and freedom and the things that would make B.F. Skinner disappointed in us. Thank you. <laughs>